joining in on a late Saturday afternoon and on the last day of the conference. I know it, it's, it's turning out to be, you know, we need to be in a hurry to go home, but yeah, thanks for joining in. I really appreciate that. My name is Zaheer. Uh, I've been learning Agile since past eight years now. I got this opportunity to drive this Agile initiative within my organization. Uh, I have got with me Rituparna, my colleague, my friend. Uh, the idea today is we, we, we plan to share our experience in the next 35 to 40 minutes on what has been our Agile initiative at our organization and how it turned out to be a huge change management initiative for us, I think. So we started our journey at, in 2005 where, where the initial part of the journey was to streamline the Scrum and processes within our organization and try to pilot some of our projects with some flavor of distributed design. That's how we started our journey. But as, as we moved ahead and we started partnering with our customers in the large Agile transformation initiative, we realized that it actually disrupted the way our roles were there in our system. It actually disrupted the way the particular goals and objectives were there for particular roles and object, uh, particular roles that were there in the system. And what happened then was, while the team were enjoying the Agile way of execution, they really appreciated the way the Agile executes. But then somewhere th there was a conflict between what they're doing on the ground and what the system they wanted as part of the goals and objectives. So that was one of the challenges that we started facing. Other aspect is some of the roles were starting getting, you know, questioned, why do we need this particular role? I'm sure you guys have heard about it multiple times in other conferences. So why do we need a particular role and what is the need for the role in a particular transformation? So the roles, the charter of the people, and in terms of how do I move from a pyramid structure to a flat structure, or as we call it as a hourglass structure. I'll be touching upon the hourglass structure shortly. So that was the typical challenges that we started facing from the teams. And it, it created a huge impact on the overall HR system that we had within our organization. The other thing which impacted us was the teams were executing in two to four weeks of time frame. What it really required was the kind of a surround sub system. So we had few programs in our organization where Agile was done in a very nice way. We had our own Agile setup. We had a very fantastic way of collaboration mechanism, the Agile flows. But all of them were tailored to the particular business need of that particular program. So the challenges that we had at hand was that our internal operation system was not tuned. There was no standard way to come up with standard infrastructure across the organization that would help enable them. So that was the other important impediment that we started facing. Other impediment was, yes, more from the people aspect. Being the service organization, as you all would be understanding that, we typically are used to in a command or top-down kind of approach where we get to understand a particular task that we're supposed to do and then that's like we don't have an end-to-end -end business view. And that started creating huge impact in the way we were actually executing. So the mindset change of the people in terms of what do I really need to do to get an end perspective on business value? That, that, was, that was something with a huge mindset change and that's how we got into the following issues in terms of the people, process and technology. So from the process perspective, Agile demands a complete transparency the way we are executing. Even though in outsource environment, what required from the customer side was, what was the team doing across the distributed location? It, it, it actually required a complete transparency. So what were the kinds of mechanisms that we had to use to ensure that there's a complete transparency in the execution? And that one of the aspect was, how do I ensure what is the team doing in a real time manner? So do we have any system? Do we have any project management tool? Because our legacy system or the way we are operating was actually in a confined manner where we have been assigned a particular task to do and that's it. We don't know what the end business goal. So that was the process perspective that we are facing. Just around the surround structures, again, the way we were actually divided, the, the matrix organization that we heard something in the morning. So we had our own testing group, we had our own horizontals. But in what was happening is that, that each horizontals had their own business objectives. And when we went to the customer, the problem was we are not able to give the holistic picture, but we would have our own individual excellence in terms of test automation or test regression suits. Each of them was there in place. But then how do I get a concise view or how do we get a holistic view of things? So that was the 
challenge that we faced as part of our organization change management, and that's where we thought that it's not just about changing a agile process or implementing agile process, it is actually a huge change management initiative. And that's where we went about the organization change management framework. What we realized was, you know, while we were trying to do a lot of things in terms of bringing about improvements, uh, while we had a lot of pockets of excellences, uh, for instance, in one of our financial services domain, we had this one team uh, which, had, uh, which had been doing this for, a, a, you know, two or three years of time, and they had a lot of good practices. But the problem was these pockets of excellences were not getting replicated, not getting replicated in a manner where we could really say that there's a lot of codification which is happening within the organization. And what really was happening on the ground was there was this huge amount of paradigm shift which was happening. Uh, so we have the millennial generation which were really saying that, you know, we need to do things differently, we need to get skilled differently, we need to get trained differently. And it was very, very imperative for the organization to wake up and provide that kind of support to the teams on the ground. So which is where what we say that, you know, it's not just about, uh, you know, defining this way of working, defining a set of processes, defining a sets of tools, whatever. But if you really believe that agile needs to be, a, you know, as I call it, it's a way of life, if that's the kind of philosophy that you wish to adopt for the people within your organization, you need to do something at a much more deeper level, and that's where the entire change management initiative was being looked at, uh, which obviously looked at some of the various aspects right from the kind of vision and strategy definition that we had, the kind of processes, and again, as Zaheer was mentioning, going beyond saying that, you know, if we adopt Scrum, how do we adopt Scrum? Do we blend in the XP best practices? Do we have Kanban? Do we have Scrumban? but really going on to looking at some of the core business processes within the organization. Um, so how do you look at doing your teaming? How do you look at uh, providing the right kind of infrastructure support to people? So processes for us looked at all of that. And given the fact that the heart of this entire transformation was all about people, the people-related processes became very, very important. Technology and infrastructure. I think especially for a services organization uh, which has Okay. Um, at worst, at least 70% of the teams which would be working at offshore, uh, which would be a situation even in an agile way of development. So we uh, definitely end up following what we call distributed agile. So if we don't have the ways and means for the team to really uh, do the things on the ground, we were falling, we were, uh, you know, not being fair to the team. So while we would talk about collaboration, while we would talk a lot about one team concept, if we didn't ensure that we had the right mechanisms for the teams to sit together, the teams to actually collaborate, it would be difficult. And the problems rose from, you know, things as simple as saying, okay, make your work visual. And the team would stand up and say, hey, you know what, I really don't know how to make the work visual. And we'd go and say, okay, you know what, get a whiteboard, put all your tasks up there. Uh, you know, draw your, draw your various station, draw, put your various cards and uh, whatever are the impediments, put your impediment boards up of, op, over there on the floor. And um, we got very interesting uh, rep responses from the teams and responses as basic as saying, well, yeah, I ordered for a whiteboard, but it still hasn't come, uh, which I think are some of the blessings of being in a large organization. So those were some of the things from a core tools and infrastructural perspective that we were stymied by. Of yeah. course, um, also from the way we were really managing the projects, because till date, we were into more of the waterfall way of, uh, way of uh, project management. The project management system that we had was more tuned towards waterfall. We didn't even have a project management system which could get, um, which could get quickly turned around to suit or to adapt to an agile way of working. <coughs> Communication and stakeholder relationship. Uh, Communication at a team level, communication at a leadership level, communication at an organization level. Uh, as I mentioned by saying there were a lot of pockets of excellences. When we looked at the entire, um, you know, agile journey, what we realized is that there was one team in Hyderabad possibly who were doing a great stuff. There was no way that the rest of the team which is sitting in Bangalore or some other team which is sitting, let's say in Cochin, had an idea about what they were doing. So focusing that, focusing on that, and as well as taking this entire concept about, you know, about this new philosophy, about this new way of working to the senior leadership became equally important. Because as far as a lot of times the feeling was, okay, this is something which the client is looking for. 
another self SDLC methodology, just go ahead and do it. What's the change that you're actually wanting to drive? So communicating to the right stakeholders became very, very important. The next three things, and, I, and the reason that I've got them all together, is all about handling the change as far as people are concerned. Because we were really talking about getting people to operate in a different function, from a technical perspective, from a behavioral perspective, uh, from the way they were actually working in the teams. And that's where performance management comes and plays a very important role, and Zaheer will talk a little bit about it. Because what we were telling the teams is that, you know, you need to collaborate. You need to work as one team. You need to, need to look at the team goals. However, what we were doing is still focusing on individual excellence. So all the performance management systems that we had were driven to identify who is the best performer in the team. So there was a huge amount of dissonance in terms of what we were trying to say at a, you know, at a philosophical level and what was actually happening on the ground. So these were some of the elements that we really looked at from an entire organization change management perspective. And you know, what we said and what we took a call of a couple of years back is that this is what we will actively work towards ensuring we are able to provide to the teams on the ground. It may not happen on day one. We would have to take baby steps because uh, this is a change which we're trying to drive in a one lakh people large organization where a lot of work was still happening in the traditional manner. So you had to ensure that you were still uh, you know, you didn't create a microcosm within an entire ecosystem, but you, there had to be a gelling of the way, so gelling of the way of working between traditional and non-traditional, so to speak. But we couldn't afford to have the traditional ways of working be imposed upon the so-called non-traditional ways. I talked a little bit about the vision and strategy, and I think what really helped us was uh, a call taken at the senior management level that there would be specific investments on a people process and technology development. Because something which I have typically seen is that, you know, when you typically talk about Agile, the, the belief of a lot of people is, oh, we'll get some people trained, and we are Agile. Oh, people have gone on a one-day training, two-day training, and they're able to do the things on the ground. It was not just about the team training, it was about the buying from the management and top -down. So it was very important to ensure that you took, you had enough amount of investments, both from a time, from a financial perspective, around all of these three areas. From a people enablement perspective, and when I typically talk about skill building, I think the first thing what we realized was that there would have to be a lot of unlearning, and then relearning. Uh, so while there was a lot of basic level information which was provided in terms of what is this philosophy all about, um, you know, what are the various ceremonies that you should look at? What are the things that, uh, that make a difference? What was very important to ensure that various roles within the organization or within an agile, agile team uh, were enabled in terms of what's the kind of performance that you need to have? What is the role that you're expected to play? So as a team member, if you're expected to be a self-organizing team member, what is it that you need to do? If you're expected to collaborate, what does that mean? As a scrum master, how do you behave? Because one of the things that we typically talk about is that you're not a project manager. You don't put your project manager hat on the head. And a lot of times we actually you know, go ahead and tell people that a project manager may not be the best scrum master because you have, a, you have the same command and control um, philosophy flowing through the moment you think of a project management, you know, where, when you wear the project management hat. So as a scrum master, how do you need to behave differently. Uh, yeah. So how did you handle the unlearning part for the senior <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I think it's been tough. It's been very, very tough, especially getting the senior leadership on board. Uh, so we do the, a lot of, the, um, lot of the knowledge sharing sessions. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, our leader, that's Mr. Kure, and he himself, is a great believer, so we try and use a little bit of his shoulders to pass on some of the messages. Um, Zaheer will talk a little bit about the kind of gamification that we've, we've done to make things fun, uh, but especially for the senior leadership, it's a consistent messaging that we need to give to them. Uh, we have, I think... Uh, but the other thing is, uh, the leadership's 
started seeing the benefits when the customer push was done initially. The customers, the leadership started seeing that, okay, the customers are benefiting out of it. And then it was an eye opener for them. Also, what happened was that we internally within Wipro have our initiatives within, there are some of the systems or applications that we need to develop within for the internal people to consume. And we started developing that using Agile. Like, for example, if I look into some simple example of, I wanted to have a particular approval for my team members travel, I can do one go on my mobile application. So some of the internal applications that we developed was using Agile and we started prioritizing things and actually the management started realizing the benefits. So it was not a one day or a one, one, one day training kind of a thing, but it was a journey for us with respect to the uh, senior management. We have our internal IT team, that's about 550 yeah. large IT teams. So a lot of the kind of experimentation, uh, you know, as, as Linda was mentioning, we did some of them within the IT team itself. And those were cases that we went and uh, played back to the senior manager. So I think that helped. But yes, it be, it's been a challenge because uh, for people who are used to thinking in a different way, um, or used to thinking in a, in a fairly traditional manner, uh, for them to uh, step away and step back, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Yes. So business finance is typically, um, it was important for us to get the business finance teams on the ground because of, on our end because of the entire uh, contracts, contracts and the contract negotiation process which, uh, which we typically go through whenever we are trying to work on an agile deal. Because what we have realized is a lot of the time our, uh, the kind of tradition that we have, especially in IT services, is that, you know, get into fixed bid deals, get into fixed price uh, things, which is what people are very attuned to working in. And you have the same old waterfallish contracts, if I can use such a term, which you try and uh, you know, sort of impose on an agile project. So it was very important to get the business finance team on the ground uh, on our side saying that you know, this is how things are going to be happening differently. So these are the risks. So your risks are really different from what you were looking at earlier, as well as from the business development perspective for them to understand what this beast was all about. Otherwise, they would go ahead and make you know, all kinds of commitments, which is not that they don't do that till now, right. uh, but. <laughs> yeah, actually, the way we started focusing here because some of our customers were on a large transformation journey. And what happened is that the vendor managers at the customer side started speaking the language of Agile when they came to contracting. And it became very necessary for us, uh, for the teams in the uh, financial and the business everything team to understand the contracting terms when we are moving into Agile. Because it was all for them, it's a fake, uh, fixed price kind of contracting and all because they, that's something they were used to and how to go away with that and because as the customer was increasing their maturity in Agile, it became necessary for them to understand what, what they're speaking about. So that means contract would also revise? Yes, on time in fact, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there is one more role if I can add on. So there is a role that you're talking about, Agile coach role. Yes, so when we started this journey, we did have external coaches and there was a point of time when we realized that yes, the coaches did bring us to some level of maturity. But then how do we achieve the sustainability of the teams? Because unless we achieve that, then there is no real benefit that we are achieving out of the coach that we got from the external world. So what we started doing is we started seeding or incubating the coaches within our uh, organization. Because there would be some practitioners who would like to get into the role of the coaches. And then that's where we came up with a actually a coaching program and or entire coaching cookbook that we had. So that those guys, once the external coaches are out, they can take up um, the role and sustain the team. So they could be within the power of the organization, part of the team who can take up the role. So this was one of the critical things that we had to take up. And you see uh, the term which is mentioned over there is agile coach stroke manager. manager yeah. And that is again a part of the entire change management uh, you know, philosophy yeah. because what we realized is when we go and tell a person who is typically, let's say a delivery manager, then that you know, what you need to work is more of an agile coach. And the first reaction that we get back is, hey, hold on, I'm a manager, why are you changing my designation? So there's a lot of resistance which comes from the way people perceive uh, their role and people perceive their so-called uh, you know, relevance within the entire structure. So I think those are some of the learnings that we've had. And one of the most, <coughs> sorry. No. no. It has to be a different yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what we have, and Zaheer will talk a little bit about the uh, about how the entire structuring happens. 
What we are very clear is in terms of who is responsible for the people management aspect of the team. So you can, we have, we've tried to ensure that we don't set the wrong precedences because the usual, uh, you know, usual tendency is that, okay, there'll be a scrum team, you will have a scrum master and the scrum master is the, the, is the manager within the team. And that is something which we go ahead and ensure uh, we, we almost go, you know, on the, on the, on the border of fanaticism around it saying that, your scrum master is not the person who manages the rest of the team. Of course, that puts on a little, a lot of, a lot, lot of pressure onto the, uh, you know, onto the people management perspective. But those are some of the things that we've tried to institutionalize. I think this is something on which I'll take the next two minutes, is to really put together a program of ensuring that behaviors get changed. And once again, the entire aspect of behavioral change, change, does not happen overnight. So I'll, I'll take your liberty and share one joke. Uh, one of the things that we typically talk about is that how do you be a better servant leader? Um, so I was having this discussion with some of the senior, you know, senior managers uh, within the team, within a particular account, and I was telling that, uh, you know, you need to embrace servant leadership. And after about two minutes of talking, I saw this, I saw this gentleman's face, and it had, he was a fair gentleman, by the way, and it had gotten absolutely red. So I said, you know, you seem a little bit agitated. Is there a problem? So he said that, uh, you know, why are you calling my team servants? They're not my servants. This is not expected of you, Ritu. So I said, well, I am not really saying that your team, you know, I'm not calling your team as servants, but I didn't even have to finish my words. And he got even more agitated saying that, you know, do you mean I'm their servant? So that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of reactions that happen on the ground. Uh, so in fact, we've even got suggestions from people saying that, you know, why are you calling it a servant leader? You should change that term. The term servant is not a very nice term to use. So those are all of the things that we would see on the ground from a so-called um, leadership layer, if I have to, if I have to use that, that kind of a term. But for our organization, especially being in services, what was also important was the teams had to undergo a change. Because this was a team where people were very used to working in a command and control model. This was a team which was very used to, you know, youngsters coming in and somebody telling them, okay, this is what you need to do. These are your tasks for tomorrow. And we were now telling people that, hey, you know what? You need to self-organize. You need to be a self-directed team, which is very easy for us to say, but unless we give people the right kind of training, the right kind of enablement, the right kind of confidence, it's very difficult for them to say, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to be the master or the mistress of my own destiny. So those were some of the things that we, um, that we focused on. If you look at assertive communication, uh, what people typically say, you know, ask me that, you mean, we should talk like you, we should talk loudly, we should talk brashly. And so uh, there's a lot, there's a, there's a difference which people don't need to understand, which people don't understand that when we talk about assertive communication, it's all about standing up and saying, Mr. Product Owner, I don't agree with you. Or Mr. Scrum Master, as a team, this is what we believe we can do. This is an impediment. Please help us resolve this particular impediment. No, we cannot do it. We, in fact, have sessions which we do for teams, yeah. which is in terms of how do you say no to your Scrum Master, coach, product owner, whoever it might be. In fact, this was a very challenging aspect for us because being in the service company and working with multiple partners for the customer, we had to be really assertive in our communication because otherwise it's, it's going to be a huge challenge for us. And that, 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 that was a key aspect for us, assertive communication. Yeah. Can the uh, assertive communication could be a roadblock in terms of mental partnership? Exactly. It, 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 we hit that because what, what happened was that when we were on this journey, there were some of our partners who were not in a jack. So they were just beginning to there are some of our customers who were mature, there are some of our customers who were the journey, there are some of the customers who had just heard the agile buzzword. So there are different kinds of challenges based on the different kind of engagement that we were doing. So how did you mitigate that? So it, 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 it was not a overnight kind of thing. Right. So it's like for some of the customers who are really mature in agile, they just want us to do a prescribed way of agile that they have been doing, but then we have to challenge them. There are some of the customers who are on the, on the journey. They really seek our support in terms of our experience with some other engagements and how we go about. So it's, it's a mutually collaborative kind of thing. I think what was very important was to stand up and tell about the impediments very, very openly. And a lot of times in the initial days, 
as coaches, we ended up doing those things even with the customers. So I'll give you one example. We were working with this, uh, we still do, uh, with this uh, financial services client of ours based in the East Coast. And uh, the team on the ground, and they were just, they were on the agile journey, and the team on the ground after a couple of weeks, uh, you know, I heard a lot of murmurs on the, on the floor saying that, you know, this is just something which is horrible. So I was probing that, you know, what's so bad about it? Um, it was very interesting. They said that, hey, you know what? You guys have told that we need to attend all of the ceremonies. So this was a distributed team. So we need to attend all of the ceremonies. We need to get into doing the daily stand-ups and XYZs. The client has and client fixes these up as per their time convenience. So we end up staying back in India till about 10, 30, 11 in the night. And next day our manager expects that we be back on the floor at 9 o'clock. So we did two things in that case. First, have an internal communication with our leader saying that, you know, whoever is the manager who says that teams have to be here at 9 o'clock, you need to change that. You need to ensure the teams are able to work till 11.30. So if they're working till 11.30, you need to ensure that they are provided with the right kind of infrastructure, right, from the transportation, the food, whatever you have. And then when the client came, in, incidentally, the client was coming back, came back to India, the, I think there was a visit some two weeks after our conversation. We stood up in a meeting and we said, you know what, we are having a problem. We are not, we haven't defined, we haven't been able to define a core hour of overlap which is conducive to both parties. And that's when the client leadership stood up and said, you know, good point, we'll start our day at eight o'clock, you ensure that you stay back till about nine and we'll make this work. So a lot of time it's having the conviction to stand up and yeah. tell about those impediments uh, so that the, those get removed. And that's the entire change which we are trying to also drive on the ground. I think we've been a little bit better than earlier, but again, not the end of the road. Yeah, so uh, we talk a lot about the cross-scaling and multi-scaling, and we have been thinking on how do we achieve that. You know, it's easier to say, but how do we achieve that? And uh, what we realized is that any new entrance in the organization, somebody who coming from the college, right from out from the college, the focus in the induction plan was based on the technology, like a Java or a .NET and so on. But they were not exposed to something like, how do I achieve a continuous increase in CI, CD kind of a thing? How do I go about using a cucumber and jerk imprint? So, you know, that was the kind of thing which we realized and what we did was, as part of the induction plan, we gave them an introduction about what is this continuous integration? What are those engineering practices that you need to learn and understand right from the beginning? So that what happens is that, they are just in the initial stages and they, as they move on, apart from understanding the domains, the technologies, some of the engineering aspects are well right, incubated right from the beginning. So that was the first thing that we did as part of uh, cross-killing. Other thing was, I touched upon uh, the hourglass. Any idea what the hourglass indicates? Uh, any other uh, guess? Sorry? Team structure, right, yeah. So initially, uh, as Ritu was mentioning, we were completely a pyramid structure, and our middle management was really top heavy. Okay. Now, yes, those middle management had moved themselves into a purely operational kind of a work, but then as we moved into agile, their roles became redundant. But then at the same time, what we realized is it was the years of experience that they were into. They had amazing years, domain experience, they had really good technical skills. What we did was, the hourglass structure is actually, if I squeeze a pyramid, my middle layer, it would either go up or it will come down. So when those roles started becoming redundant, what happened was that some of those people were actually able to take up some of the domain skills, were actually able to become domain consultants, or they were able to take up some of the architectural part. Or if I had a large scaling engagement, they were able to do a program across my releases. So you know, those were the kind of things which they were able to do. Some of the teams preferred to be at the team level doing the things at the ground. It could be a scrum master, it could be a technical person. So that's where we call about this hourglass structure wherein, yes, they had one core skill, but then they were able to move upwards or downwards because they started their careers as engineers, they started their careers as domain consultants, and then they had, because of the way the Wipro or any other service companies is aligned, what happens is that in order to move up the career chain, they moved into a management role, but then they got a chance to again Get back. So that's what the concept of our class is all about. Were they not resistant to this thing? Oh, you want to answer that? Yeah. Huge amount of resistance. Huge, huge amount of resistance. The first thing which we heard when we told people on the ground uh, in terms of
you know, don't identify yourself as a developer. Don't identify yourself as a uh, tester or a PA. You're a team member. I remember, I still remember this lady who came up to me and said that, I'm a lead architect. What the hell are you talking about? So there's a lot of resistance. Um, I think what happens is somewhere over the, you know, over the cycles or uh, the delivery cycles, which typically I have seen it takes a three to four month period for somebody to from a, becoming a completely disbeliever and a huge amount of, you know, having a huge amount of resistance to gradually move. Because especially for our organization or services organization, the things that we talk to people very, um, you know, and we emphasize is upon the kind of technical skill building that is possible for them to do. So, you know, you are typical from I to P to Y. You talk about that kind of a skill building. Second is the amount of client interfacing that they, that they are able to do. Because in your typical pyramid structure, uh, and I, I don't know whether that is relevant within your organization, but I know it's relevant in our organization. So you have this whole layer of what we're doing if you were to call such a certain thing. And then you have the layers. And in the layers, you end up talking to the customers. And this, and over here, you have the junior most person uh, being forced to talk to the customer for at least 15 minutes a day because your product owner is there in your DSM. Uh, what helped us, I think, was the huge amount of support that we were able to give the teams on the ground in terms of getting themselves reskilled and reoriented. But yes, uh, I mean, uh, in the initial days, yes. uh, it's typical yes. people say that, oh, you're in an agile project. Who are you? It's like people were not appreciating the fact that, okay, the title as a program manager or a delivery manager or project manager is being so diluted. Yes. Yes. Right, but then they started enjoying the... Yeah, if you're a program manager, it's a developer, it's the program manager. Yeah, in fact... Yeah, that's correct. Kind of, in fact, what happened is that some of the people whom I have been working closely with, they actually started enjoying once they moved into the top role because they were interfacing closely with the business. They were interfacing closely with the technical guys. And that's where the value started coming up. Otherwise, they were pure transactional kind of a doing work, and that was not actually helping them. So, uh, in the interest of the time, uh, sorry, so I have 10 minutes, so I'll quickly, yeah. I'll about go. the R class, I just want to ask you one thing. The R class means that it was like a division of what you call the executive leadership and the scrum teams, or it is more role based, like scrum teams and, okay, the product owner and. Yeah, so we had this huge middle layer. Exactly. What, what about the what middle so, management falls into what? I mean, so it I, either it depends on their, we will we'll have it to them whether they want to move up there. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. Is that what we have? There was a question. Yeah. When Agile is initially implemented and there is change in role, so I do understand you know, that opportunity to talk to business directly for everyone, be the new guy and the old guy. So that gives like encouragement and newness. But after a while, how do you keep these employees motivated? Because in other structure, you have like, uh, in Indian context at least, every two or three years person is assuming that I will move up and then up and lead uh, and super lead and someone. Well, I don't but have much time, but I'll take it offline. I, I will cover it slightly here and then probably offline. Yeah, we did face this issue, yeah. So, uh, uh, in the interest of our time, do I, do I need to play some game here, or do you guys want to play some game here? Uh, what we did was that some of our current generation, as I call it, they got fed up sitting in the classroom for two days and understanding what is Scrum and what is. So, what we did was, you know, they, they can, at their own free time, play some of these games and, you know, understand the concept. It's not coming up. Hmm? Right. You know, old people like us. So we injected that that kind of fun uh, element to this learning, and a lot of the senior leadership need right. or so-called senior management need, we would have these kind of things. In, in fact, we also have a lot of road shows during the lunch time, so that people come and understand this, you know, and play. So you know, this is one of the games. So uh, I, I, do you want you guys to try this out? You know, yeah. rearrange the images to solve the puzzle. You know. So what happens is that it's it's, it's actually online. I try to. Uh, do, get it offline here. So once the team completes, a particular person completes, and it starts competing with other people. So who, how does I complete faster? And it actually ambivalents the learning along with that. 
So what else? This is the simplest of the game that I'm showing you here. Uh, there is one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which one do you want me to work? Just try and double click on any slide. So, yeah. you know, we force so, people to also read. So, if you double click on a slide, you know, double click on a tile, the entire thing pops up. What is this thing all about? So, that's how we try to inject a bit of fun, a bit of learning into yeah. the thing. Yeah. Other thing is uh, some other games, you know, we also had a Konbanega Karodpati kind of a game. And, uh, you know, it's like it allows a person to go through a series of. Yeah. So, in, in fact, it was. We didn't have the Ice Bucket Challenge at, those, at that point of time. But I remember we had the senior leadership meet and we had you know, some of our general managers and GPs and we called them into the booth and we said, hey, you know what, play the game and the rest of the team is going to watch what is it that you're going to do. And for every, you know, everything which they were able to do correctly or incorrectly, there's a lot of, there's a lot of engagement which happened on the ground. I think yeah. Those are things which have been important in um, sort of getting us onto the transformation. We also track. had a scenario based game where, you know, I'm performing the role of a scrum master or a product owner as a team member. As a scenario, I get a particular scenario, what would be I, what would be the best thing that I would be doing in that particular situation? So that was a scenario based game that we also developed. Uh, that's the common quest that I'm talking about. It's within our Wipro intranet it's for our pro employees. <laughs> I don't mind if you guys can join us. <laughs> our doors are open. No, but in fact, uh, what we do is a lot of the times for a lot of our client engagements, these are shared and these are put on the client network as well. So the teams can, you know, teams can do it, uh, you know, jointly. So it's not as if only the pro teams have access. Right, these games are developed by the freshers, college pass out, and implemented in agile games. Yeah. It's a quick, quickly developed by me. Okay, so. Uh, Career growth, yeah. Some of the people, I think someone asked me a question about career growth here. What, what we had was we had a typical this kind of a structure, uh, the pyramid structure. What we are trying to move is we move right move towards this kind of dream structure where we have a core scrum team and support structure in terms of our release manager, agile group. Release manager, program manager could be based on the scaling that we have. And our other support team, the architect team, build team. So this is the kind of structure that we are to. Uh, I think I can uh, discuss in detail probably offline because in terms of time I'm asked to. But if, if I could just add to that, what we have done, and, and I think that, that's, a, that's been a very bold step definitely for our organization. Um, the entire career framework has been redefined exactly. for people in agile projects. So there's a very clear roadmap in case you want to be a career agile person. Um, what is the way that you go forward on it? As well as if you want to still ensure that you have a degree of fungibility, that you might want to work in an agile project tomorrow or in a non-agile traditional project. Because in Wipro, we have all kinds of work which we do, right? From application development to infrastructure maintenance and so on and so forth. So how do you ensure that you still have the fungibility? And yet, if you want to, you know, if you believe that this is what I want to do and this is the way I want to develop my, uh, you know, develop my career further, we've now offered people that kind of a roadmap as well. And that's something which helps build a lot of encouragement within the teams because now they know it's not just, you know, I'm just sort of just building some skills and tomorrow it's going to get wasted or not. Right in now. fact, I, I shared about the challenges in the first slide saying that, okay, people are not clear about the charter and both of In fact, we have now put it in our system where we have a career hub in terms of agile, wherein what is a particular role supposed to do and what is the next level career map from the agile team perspective. So that is something which we have in place now. Yeah, uh, communication part. So we, we do a lot of, we, we just concluded our Wipro Agile Day 2014. We had Tathagat Verma also representing us and talking about the scaling Agile. So this is the way we actually encourage, understand, make people understand what Agile is all about within our organization. We do have a newsletters coming out, which is a fortnightly, monthly, quarterly based on coming from the senior management. Some of our existing programs sharing their case studies, sharing their experiences in the form of this, uh, recognizing people and you know, as part of uh, this was the, we had one of our speaker uh, at the conference talking about the enterprise scale and how is it impacting Wipro. So it, it's the way we are trying to communicate, understand, you know, be, make people understand what Agile is all about. You know, it's, 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 it has been a challenge for us to 
just go by you know training it's it's about how do we try to communicate across the organization i think training is only the first part of the engagement uh, looking at these kind of other things have definitely helped us build on that a lot better so you know the one gentleman who's speaking over here on the left hand side he's a gentleman who manages the uh, delivery for one of our business units overall so he has about what five or six thousand odd people that end up working for him and he, he ends up talking to people on the floors within sessions talking about what are the kind of challenges from a career perspective what's the kind of difference that it makes and those are things which help bring bring down a lot of the resistance that we had seen a in the organization a management team speaking about agile and encouraging is something what we have been doing yeah that, that's there's a this graph out there uh, right you know, bottom right right yeah so was there any some like with metrics that you put in which helps your reputation and it was one of the case study to share about on how they went about things oh, okay yeah. so to do with the project and mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. sharing some of the best practices some of the experience where they might even feel you know it's not about just sharing something which you had succeeded about yeah. did, did you put up a system in the lightweight metric yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, other aspect is uh, the technology part you know as ritu was talking about you know we want it it's done can i take another one minute <laughs> thanks sir Right. So, uh, from a technology perspective, you know, uh, I spoke about the challenges in terms of the having a complete transparency across our customers, across our partners. So, one of the things, oh, sorry, one of the things that we came up with was uh, cloud-based CLM. So, cloud-based CLM, which helps us, the underlying platform could be RTC or it could be a TFS or it could be anything, but the cloud CLM would actually help us come up with our engineering practices, and it would help us having complete transparency across the partners and across our customers so if a customer is new to agile and they don't have any ail and tool in place we give them as a free of cost you know so that's that's how we want to collaborate with them that's one of the example i can take off this offline because there are a lot of things which i can talk about here but then uh, i he stops staring at me right now <laughs> with that uh, thanks a lot guys uh, i i just wanted to add one last part uh, is that for us you know this is the change management journey in my mind is just the initial days this is something that every day we learn something new we try something new it's almost as if we are experimenting um, earlier we were experimenting within individual team levels we have now gained enough amount of um, experiences around some of the areas where we are now trying codification at an organization level so that's a little bit about what we are doing just to add with uh, wipro agile day is scheduled in pune next year if anybody wants to be a speaker please come back to me yeah <laughs> thanks for thank you, thank you.